right? Okay, well, hello, everybody. Elizabeth, did you want to? Sure, wanna absolutely. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Thanks so much for being with us for this next Flight School Connector conversation, really, and that's what we hope it will be. Uh, today, we are going to talk about using a syllabus uh, as a way to help you manage curriculum. And so I am actually going to turn it over to Chris here in just a second. Uh, Chris is our Senior Director of Flight Training Education. He's also a highly experienced CFI, uh, a classroom teacher, so he has a lot of insights into the education world, and he's even flown as a cargo pilot. And then also joining us behind the scenes, uh, making sure that all of our technology works and helping us with your questions and any other issues that may come up is Steven Schroeder. He is our flight training coordinator and uh, counting on him to keep us running smoothly today. So with that, I will turn it over to Chris. Well, hey, everybody, and I hope you all can see my screen uh, that we've got going hearing a little bit of an echo. I mean, I'll just make, I'll talk a little bit quieter. That might fix it. Um, and so, uh, thanks, Elizabeth. So, yes, we're doing today, uh, we had a request from um, basically you guys that somebody wrote in a request that we talk about uh, curriculum management and accountability when it comes to uh, flight school training. So let's go ahead and take a look at our agenda for the day. So today's agenda is going to talk about um, why we want to use a syllabus. So I want to go get a little bit of background, and I'm hoping that a lot of you folks already do. And we're going to find out uh, here shortly. We're going to do a poll, I know, coming up very shortly. We're going to talk about 61 versus 141 programs um, and probably uh, just do a quick overview of that. I'm, I bet a lot of you folks are already familiar with that. Um, then we'll talk a bit about some of the record keeping requirements and then how to select a syllabus. And I've done a comparison uh, from all the different providers that are out there. And I know a few of the folks are on here on the call as well. So I want to thank you guys for being here. And then uh, what we can do for you. So we want to find that out at the end. So we're going to uh, do that kind of similar model. I did want to take a moment to uh, thank Sporty's Pilot Shop. They have generously sponsored Flight School Connector. So we're really excited to have them on board. Uh, and it's... Uh, it's great to have them, so make sure you check out their good products. Learn to fly here at Sporty's Pilot Shop. All right, so let's start off just finding an idea of where we stand with uh, syllabus usage. So, Stephen, if you'd roll the poll, and we'll see if you folks can just uh, click and pit, make a choice there. We want to see where you are. Do you have a formal syllabus that you use? Uh, maybe I know some schools will just have their CFIs uh, independently in charge of that and train students. Uh, and then, you know, some might just be syllabus. What syllabus? You know, I, we got other folks to take care of that. Or maybe it's something else. So if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and, and click so we get an idea of kind of where we are with the audience and having everybody here. I'd be curious to see what the results look like. I would love to take this opportunity to um, encourage folks to participate. Please feel free to leave us notes in the chat box as we go. We will take time to answer your questions, uh, participate in the polls, and when we get to a spot where we can pause and have some discussion, feel free to raise your hand or turn on your camera to let us know that you would like to speak. and. Let's turn this into a discussion. It's the most valuable we have found when we actually get a conversation going. So, uh, and in the meantime, if you're not speaking, I'd encourage you to just go ahead and mute your microphone so we don't get any feedback. Cool. Thanks, Elizabeth. And um, I know we're watching the poll. It's like, actually, we've got it already see it showing up there. We've got a lot of folks using a, for, a syllabus and a few that have the CFIs. So we'll just give that a little moment longer and see where we are. And just in case that there is a little symbol too that Elizabeth mentioned raising your hand, that is really helpful for us because it helps us to just let us know that you uh, want to say something. So there's a little symbol. I know that the, the one that I'm looking at currently has like the little smiley face with a hand and that's the one you click on. And then uh, once you do that, then we can uh, unraise your hand when we're done. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely make sure we call and we always keep an eye on that chat window. So, all right, let's go ahead and maybe show the results of the poll. Looks like we've got a large portion of folks that are using a formal syllabus. And there we go. And I guess I need to let me close that part of the poll. I guess, can everybody see that, the uh, results there in the, in the chat window? Is that where it's showing up for the poll? 
Yep. Okay. So yeah, what I'm seeing is I got 80, yeah, 83 percent of folks saying they use a formal syllabus. About 16 percent saying that they can train. So that's really good, and I'm really glad to see that we've got nobody saying that they don't use anything at all. So that's really, really good. So let's go ahead and we're going to move um, to our next slide and start talking about some of the reasons why we might want to use a syllabus. And so it sounds like you already are there. So for those that are already using a syllabus, which I um, very much applaud, um, this will just give you hopefully some reinforcement about why, why it's a good idea to use a syllabus. We did some research back um, uh, some years ago called the Flight Training Experience Research, which I have abbreviated to FTE. Some of you are probably familiar with that. And in doing that, it's definitely that research showed that students want organized and effective flight instruction. Um, and I'd actually done some research in the past on this stuff, sort of follow up research on top of all of this. And in that same research, too, we found that 63% of students train part 61, which we know doesn't necessarily require a syllabus. Um, but students wanting that organized and effect effective instruction, I would argue, it is really helpful to use a syllabus to help make that happen. It definitely makes it easier for that to happen. Um, it can help students and CFIs. Uh, to be able to see the plan and to make it happen. And in doing that, um, and I know from experience, because like I said, uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, I was a teacher for a long time. When I was doing my own flight training, I can remember doing, I did my um, private 141, which was helpful because I had a textbook and I had all my assignments. And then I went to do my instrument at a different school and they didn't have a syllabus. And I remember begging my instructor, can you tell me what's coming up next? Because I didn't know what was happening. He would just kind of throw things at me and I, I had no way to prepare. And so that said, having a syllabus so that students can prepare ahead of time actually can help. And it's been found in not just me saying this, but in studies that I've found uh, that it helps reduce anxiety and certainly can increase the efficiency of your training because students can be ready ahead of time. You're not trying to, you know, you don't necessarily have to spoon feed them. If you have a motivated student, they will read ahead of time. They will study. So when they come with the instructor, they can spend that time learning how to do it rather than having to walk them step by step through it. So that saves them money, makes the training time more efficient, which is, I, I know that that's all of our goal. And then, of course, today's topic being record keeping. By having a syllabus, by doing record keeping and having an SOP, which basically is a standardized way of doing your procedures and everything else, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that, like doing stalls a certain way and so on, um, it makes stage checks, it makes transitions uh, going from CFI to CFI easier because we already know how this is supposed to be done. We know um, what the you know, how a stall should be done at our school. This is the way that we do it. So there's no question about well, my CFI does it that way. We know how it's supposed to be done and it makes it easier for the student and reduces that anxiety again, because they're not being questioned on, are you doing that the right way? Uh, and then finally, uh, again, that overall picture, helping them prepare and maximize training time. And I'll tell you, one of the experiences that I had, if, if you are having trouble with your CFIs, if you do have a standardized way of doing things or a syllabus, um, I know my own experience, I had gone to a school in Arizona to do my uh, commercial and, and all my training after that, my CFI multi and all the other stuff. And I remember we implemented out there, um, it was while I was, be was, I think I was a brand new CFI at that point, um, they implemented a, uh, a school-wide SOP, a much more detailed syllabus. And at first, there's a lot of pushback in the sense of CFIs. Well, that's not the way I do it. I don't teach stalls that way. And one of the big things that I found was a, a good way to explain that and to help persuade them was to, you know, I, I had known from teaching too, this isn't for you, the CFI, this is for your students. It makes it easier for them. Um, so when, you know, it's an easier job for them. So that's when you think about it that way, it's a customer service thing helping the customer out so that CFIs kind of need to get over that. Um, but if you explain to them, it's gonna actually gonna help their students. And once they get into the flow, I found that that really did help. And it, and it did, it's a little bit of, you know, um, difficulty or challenges at first, but once we got in the flow and we realized this is the way we're gonna do things, it worked out really well and it made it much easier. And in fact, I still, going on to fly professionally, um, when I flew freight and everything, I found that that kind of training helped me all along the lines and it's part of what I still instruct now. So it's a good way to do it. All right. Um, I also wanted to share with you another reason just to keep encouraging you to keep using that syllabus is that it actually drives customer satisfaction. I actually did a research study last year and um, I did, I took the 2019 flight training experience survey, the data from that. And in there, we ask about customer satisfaction via the net promoter score. And then we also had some questions about syllabus usage either by CFIs or by schools. And I did a regression analysis and just, I got the numbers here and I know you may all not be familiar with statistical numbers, but that's why I put a legend on here. So what we found was that the use of syllabus, of a syllabus by schools, 
um, that regression between that and promoting good customer satisfaction or high customer satisfaction had a p-value of 0 0.001. Now, to give you an idea of what that means, statistically significant values are anything less than 0 0.05. So you can see my result of po less than 0 0.001 was really significant. Actually, that number was even farther less. The standard notation is just to go 0.001. It was actually like 0 0.0000 and had a whole bunch of zeros when I did this. And then there's this R squared number, which shows that um, if you wanted to figure out how much of that factor could be explained on rising or raising that customer satisfaction score, that R squared number tells you that. So in other words, that about 23% of the increases in customer satisfaction could statistically be explained by using a syllabus by a school. And you'll see a similar result with the CFI. Um, CFIs, again, that significant result of less than 0 0.001, and then about 14% of the customer satisfaction when it came to them, somebody rating their CFI could be explained by the use of a syllabus. So pretty powerful results, very statistically significant. One interesting thing I just threw on there because my by far my biggest one uh, result, my most powerful result in that study was the use of constructive criticism, which means not just, hey, you did great, that's wonderful, but actually giving them feedback saying, um, this is what you did well, here are the things you need to work on. That was by far the most powerful. Look at that with 50 of R squared of 0 0.54, 54% of customer satisfaction could be explained through that one. So just want to show that that organized, letting the person know the big picture and moving them forward is a really powerful way to not only help them learn, but also to drive customer satisfaction, which we want, because that, of course, that promotes people sticking around longer and being good customers. So that said, these are just some of the reasons I wanted to review, just talking about why we should use a syllabus. I'm so glad that so many of you were already on board and doing it anyway, which is awesome. But let's take a look, and this is where I'd like to open up uh, a discussion uh, for you and maybe that you guys can and tell us something either through the chat or if you want to raise your hand and give us a suggestion. I'll start it off here. What do we want to look for in a syllabus? And, and for me, one of the key factors, and I didn't mean to delete my number one there, but let's see if I can fix that. Um, one of the key factors is, uh, for me, flexibility. I think it's really important that we are able to adjust and adapt to the students. Uh, and so that's one thing there that I thought was important. All right, so let's see what we got. I got a hand raised there. Let me see, I have to go to people, I believe, to be able to see that. And then if Elizabeth, you just let me know if anybody is in the chat window because I can't see those both at once. So whoever's, I can't see yet the hand raised. So we do have a, uh, a suggestion from yes. Ron. Uh, meets or exceeds the ACS. Awesome. Meets or exceeds ACS. Perfect. Because you obviously want to get them to the point where they're ready for check ride, and going above and beyond the standard is always good. I mean, I always tell my students our goal is always plus or minus zero um, versus just plus or minus 100 on altitude. We want to be getting zero, and it just happens to be that our, our uh, allowances, our tolerances are that far. All right, what else do we maybe have? Just looking over here. Did I get the person that raised their hand? Uh, I, I think that person has had their hand raised from the beginning, so I'm going to go ahead and put that down. Okay. And if you actually intend to raise your hand, um, please go ahead and raise it again, and then we will and we will know. <laughs> Um, and then if anybody else, just maybe give me another idea. Um, love to hear from you guys. So it's like, please feel free just to put it in the chat window there. You'll see that what looks like a little cartoon bubble and throw it in there. Or um, please feel free to also just unmute, maybe raise your hand or unmute and let us know what you're thinking. I'll throw another one up there just while we're um, taking a moment for that. Um, I know for me, one of the things that I really like is I like to see the flight and ground um, sort of working together. I'm trying to think of a better way to say that. But what I mean by that is that that while you're doing the groundwork, let's say that you're working on cross country training, that that's when you learn about cross country planning versus doing it maybe sort of disjointed somewhere else in the training, because I feel like it makes it more um, applicable because I can see what I'm learning and now I'm applying it in the airplane. Um, now, Elizabeth, I know that you had a thought about that too, based on your own training that, um, that you saw as well. You want to share that? Sure, sure. You know, it's funny because there are so many different approaches to this particular aspect of training. Um, for me, I found it easier to uh, 
do the groundwork just with a book and uh, and take the test before I really got into my flight training. But I have to acknowledge that I didn't really learn the material. I learned to pass the test. And so it was super helpful to then go back with an actual flight instructor and go through those things and have them make sense as you're actually doing them. Because uh, learning to pass the test is one thing and learning to really understand the content, something else entirely. So maybe what I would say here is, because it's like, I know um, that was, was that during your private or was that your instrument that you, that happened? I, I actually did that with both. Because okay. yes. I know your instrument, you finished it up doing one of those um, uh, those compressed courses, right? The two week deal or That's something right. like that, right? Eight days, and, yes. And, and so that's why I made the point here. One of the things to consider is consider the structure of what you're trying to do. Obviously, if you're doing some sort of really compressed thing, you're going to need to have the students come with their ground already done because there's not going to be time to get all that finished and get the written test and all that sort of stuff happening. Um, so I can see the the point there, but to me, the the one con is just what you mentioned is that they're going to learn something, maybe VORs that have no real world context for what that is. But if the goal is to try to get them done in a compressed course, that could work really well. I see Jamie's got a comment here. I'm doing training right now for your ATP. No syllabus, just winging it. Very frustrating. It would be great to have that step by step syllabus. Also, an end goal would be great to have for each lesson. Yes, Jamie. See, we're on the same page. I, I love it. Um, and so I totally agree that for me as a teacher, that drove me nuts. I, I literally had my instrument instructor write down on a, a napkin. I said, Can you show me a syllabus so I know what's coming next? And he wrote down BAI holds and approaches. And that was it. And I was very frustrated about that. So, yes, I, it's great to have. All right. Um, I guess what we'll do is we'll go ahead and move on. I, I I want you guys to very much think about, even if we didn't, um, uh, you didn't necessarily submit something to this, but think about what it is you'd like to see and think back like Jamie does, think back to your, or currently think to your student experience and what would help you be better. And then even ask your, the people that are at your school, your customers, uh, what they think about it or what would help them. It's a really good question. All right. So what I wanted to share was a little bit of, and this again comes from some of the research that I've done in the past, what makes a good syllabus and one of the things that I would argue is that following, since most of us are dealing with adults, even though we might have a few that, you know, folks out there that are the 16, 17 year old that is going to get their pilot certificate like on their birthday, we know that the vast majority of customers are either college age or beyond. We also have a big bump in the middle age of folks just kind of fulfilling those life dreams. And so adult learning theory really comes to play here. And what I did was I, I very much summarized down some of the core parts of adult learning theory because I've read entire books on this, but this is just some of the key things that I found. And with that, that instructional materials, so when you're thinking about picking a syllabus, those should include um, things like they should be individualized because adults don't like the sort of cookie cutter approach that we might find in grade school. They are much more, think about it, if, you, if you're going to training and you're forced to sit down for something, it's like unless it's something you're particularly doing, you usually have not a whole lot of interest in it. You're kind of like, where can I use this? So it has to be practical, individualized to what it is that they are doing. So think about that when picking a syllabus. Does it allow that to happen? Um, real world and relevant. They want to see those practical things. The theoretical stuff normally is not a driver for motivation. It's more about how can I practically use this? Because when I can see that practical use, I'm much more likely to say, oh, that's why I want to do this. So that's a really good thing to look for is how can I apply that? So when looking at a syllabus, does it help you potentially do that? Or is there a way for my instructors to do that? It's got to be constructive, sequential, and interlinked. In other words, it's that steady progress building upon one another, um, going towards a higher goal, and it should be linked together. We shouldn't just have random things. We want to show the student how to do that, and a lot of a well-written syllabus will do that for you. It'll explain why, how, like what the purpose of ground reference maneuvers are. Because there's nothing more frustrating to go out and do a rectangular course, like why are we doing this? But if you can explain, well, that actually helps us when we're doing wind correction in the pattern, and really what you're doing is practicing the traffic pattern, that's a big help. Um, and then, you know, when, and it just comes to that whole part. And in fact, it's amazing the light bulbs that go off. I still have that now. I'll be working with folks and I'll, I'll explain, like we're coming in, we're turning base and I'll say, hey, what's the wind doing? What do you need to do? And they're like, oh yeah. And it's like, they think of things like, and I'll, I'll point out to them. Remember how we did turns around a point or how we did S turns? That's why we got to pay attention to this now. Um, I'm teaching an instrument student. I'm actually bringing this stuff up to an instrument student doing holds. When we talk about S turns, that whole turning down wind and why we have to change um, what we're doing and, and how it all affects our ground track and everything else. So keep that in mind. And that's a, a good syllabus will include thing, things like that in it. Uh, progressively higher ordering, higher order cognitive process. In other words, we start out simple and build to the more complex and we keep challenging uh, people as they move forward. 
Um, we want to make sure that it's clear learning outcomes. We want to see that they're tied to what it is I'm trying to achieve. So it's this idea of there should be a plan. I should be able to see the plan and I should be able to see how each little bit fits into that plan because that way I can see that I'm working towards my end goal. Like Jamie said, if it's just this sort of random thing, it's very frustrating, especially for adults, kids, even kids. This is good stuff for teaching kids too. But with adults even more so, we want that practical learning to happen and knowing where we're going and how this helps us get there is hugely important to maintain that motivation. And then finally, the idea of being challenging, interesting, and motivational. We want to give them reasons why we're doing this and, and try to make it fun, although sometimes just challenging them is a good thing too. We're going we're gonna to go out and push a little bit today. We're going to go out and push the crosswind stuff today, and we're going to see what we can get you to do because people like a challenge, especially when they can work and see progress towards achieving that, something they really enjoy. All right. So, Let's get an idea of the folks in the schools here. We're going to do another quick poll. Um, I want to find out what you are when it comes to are you running a 141 program and or maybe a 142, which I know is the flight sim version of that. Are you part 61 or maybe you're doing a combination of the two? So let's see um, what you're thinking here. And um, of course, both of these are really good. And in fact, in a moment, I spoke with, I don't know if any of you folks know uh, Jim Pittman, but I used to work. Uh, with him out in Arizona. He was actually my chief flight instructor when I was a full-time instructor. And um, we ran, we had a program that was both 61 and 141. And so I, I chatted with him a good bit about this. And we really, really found was that having a 141 program and structure actually can help structure your 61 program and make it better. But you get to take the advantage of the, the flexibility of a 61. So what I'm seeing here is we got lots of folks. We got mostly that combination of 61 and 141. And then I'm seeing a good bit there on the part 61 side as well. We're still getting a few more responses in. I'll give it another just a little bit of time and see where we are. So it looks like the majority right now, we have a 57% is part 61. We've got one 141 and or 142 provider only, and then 35%. So it looks pretty strong. Like we're mostly 61 with a good chunk of everybody here being having that 61 and a 141 program. All right, awesome. Thank you. So that said, here is an interesting thing. Um, I found it in Flying Magazine in an article, and I have the link down there for that. And actually, I believe that this came from, in the article, it cited Eric Radke from Sporties. Um, and he, they were the ones that were interviewed and talked about this. And just, it's a kind of an interesting table. I'll let you get a look at it there. But it just shows the sort of the differences, the advantages of a 61 versus a 141. I bet Lots of folks have already seen this. We've got so many out there that have both, or maybe some are considering doing a 141 program um, to add on to their 61 training. But the big thing you'll see here is that, you know, the, there's a myth that kind of goes around that 61 is, is really good because it's flexible, but 141 is really rigid. Um, and But then 61, like my experience, I did my instrument 61 where there was zero syllabus and very disorganized. Um, but in reality, one of the things when I was, like I said, I was chatting with Jim, one of the things we talked about too, which I thought was very valid, is that it's really, it depends on who's running the program. Like a well-run 141 program can be flexible and a well-run 61 program can be very structured and that's a good thing. Uh, and so there really is, we don't want to necessarily can continue that myth of um, one being better than the other. It's all about providing the right training for your students. So I think that if we borrow the structure from 141 or use that, that's great. But we also want to make sure we continue that flexibility um, that comes from the 61 uh, type of program too. And I know one thing with the 141, it says you can do it in less time, although that usually takes a superstar student to do it in the 35 hours for a private, let's say. Um, it's like they have to have somebody super motivated to make that happen. Uh, that can be a challenge. And then for 61, of course, the minimum 40. And we know that typically it's it's usually above that for both of those, unless someone's full time, full blast um, doing that. So just something to consider. An interesting article about that. And the key thing being just, I guess what the takeaway I'd like you to think of from here is that whatever type of program you're running, take the benefits of the other. Look for the flexibility in your 141 program because that is really good. And that was something that my research showed a lot too, was that flexibility is so important to individualize, individualize in the instruction. But at the same time, on the 61 side, make sure you have structure so we can see that plan going forward. 
also really important to do. And I know that can be a challenge when it comes to if your school is set up with independent instructors, that's a different thing. Cause I know with, there's a whole, I know that just in Maryland, um, when we have uh, contractors that we use, it's like there's a whole rule about when you're, you're doing an independent contractor versus an employee about what you're allowed to, um, to tell them to do. But just keep that in mind, really encourage that structure to happen. It's gonna help your students. It's gonna help maintain or to um, retain customers and students. All right. So that said, uh, one of the things too is that if on the 141 side of things, and I didn't mean to leave that link there, I'm not sure why that was still there, um, that the the TCO, the training course outline, is the law. And interestingly, here is this is often the the sort of the source of that myth. If I go 141, it's going to be rigid, but it doesn't have to be. And in fact, the FAA. Uh, I've noticed in talking to several of the providers, I was doing some, I was just giving some calls and chatting with a lot of the different providers as I was preparing for this presentation. A lot of the, the curriculum now have some flexibility written into them. So um, I know that one example, one of the early ones on, it just happened to be one that Jim worked on is the King Schools, their, their uh, sport private curriculum has a um, modular approach built into it so that it allows flexibility. And I know that I was uh, just speaking to Jefferson as well, and they said the same thing. They've just recently gotten approved to have some flexibility built in. They have a process built into that. So that's something to look at in the syllabus that you have um, is that it does it, if you're doing 141, is there a provision or is there a process written into it that allows flexibility so that you can individualize to your student? So you don't necessarily have to follow that sort of the traditional, maybe the mythological 141 approach of like, you know, you got to do lesson one. If you don't complete lesson one, you can't go on to lesson two. The FAA is allowing that. It just needs to be written and approved in your TCO. Hey, Chris, uh, we have a question, not exactly on this topic, but I think I can see where he's coming from. Uh, Eric, who asks, why do all flight schools assign a student to an exclusive instructor? And actually, Eric, we're familiar with a few schools that don't do that. Yes. A student comes into the program and they may work with every instructor in the school. Um, it's not the most common way of doing it, uh, but it, it is happening out there. What are your thoughts on that, Chris? Um, yes, and in fact, I know we did a profile, and this is a few years back now, and I know in flight school business that that a profile school, I want to say they were down in Texas. I'd have to go back and look that up. But yes, there are some that do that. I think that typically it, it might, may, is that potentially just a, um, it could be, this is the way we've always done it. We know that one of the most critical things in the research shows as well that the relationship between CFI and student is by far the most important part of somebody completing their training. If they like their CFI, it's almost like they'll die on their sword for them in a sense of you know, loyalty. Um, and, and in fact, it's one of the reasons that I, I hope you follow a practice like this is that when a new, new customer comes in, have them encourage them to fly with a couple of different flight instructors so they can find the best one, because it is so common that I hear from students. Yeah, I love it, Lonnie. You're saying the same thing. Interview our instructors so they can choose the best fit. Absolutely. Find that good fit because it is so common that you just randomly go on a discovery flight with somebody and say, well, that must be my instructor because I flew with them. And and then remember, you're in such an unequal power relationship in a sense there that this person has all the knowledge and I have none. So you just assume that the way that they're doing it is the right way. And in reality, this is a, a valuable customer to you. I mean, they're going to spend potentially 10, 15,000, however much, you know, much money it's going to be for the training um, that makes sure they've got the right person for them. So that might be why is it maybe that's relationship, but there is some value and also looking at a role to have some flexibility so they've you know fit the schedule have this other instructor fly with them and that's where the sop becomes so important too so that we're not having to jerk back and forth between well this person does stalls this way and this person does them this way if the school has an agreement this is the way we do them it makes it easy for a student to move between so that would be my thoughts on it anything else elizabeth or that was an experience you just described an experience i had as a student uh, pilot that was incredibly frustrating uh, where one instructor would have you do it one way and then maybe you'd go for a stage check uh, with a different instructor and they would tell you you were doing it all wrong. Right. And so you would try to do it to make them happy uh, and go back to your regular instructor and they would tell you you were doing it all wrong. So it's incredibly frustrating for students and they end up feeling like they really don't know where they stand. Do I or don't I know how to do this maneuver? That's uh, the right so, way. Yeah, where you can have an SOP and you can uh, and use a syllabus to also facilitate that transfer, it makes a big, big difference in the quality of experience your students are going to have. And think too, just the nerves 
I, if, if you've done your pilot training, the nerves that go through on a check ride or a stage check, because it's almost the same thing to someone that's initially going through those. I mean, the first, I mean, for me, my private instrument commercial, I think we're all like that. I got a little bit better at it as I got into the CFI and everything else. I got used to it, but the nerves, my gosh. And it's like, why give them more stress by having someone tell them they're doing it incorrectly? That's, you know, and all it is is just a difference in the method. So absolutely. I totally agree. Um, so that idea that the typical syllabus is sequential, not necessarily, it can be different. It's all about getting that TCO written the way that you would like it. And, and, um, I know from, uh, talking and I know that, uh, Paul duty from Glime is on the call too. Um, and so he may, uh, chime in a little later when we get to the question section. But, uh, one of the things he mentioned to me this morning that I thought was really, uh, interesting was the idea that, um, or oh, actually he told me that because of what's happened with COVID right now, the FAA has got a way to kind of get changes a little more quickly to happen quickly because they, people needed to make changes to ground school. So you can get changes. You can make that happen. Um, and so they just reach out to your, um, your um, inspector ASI. I know now is what it's officially called, although we often traditionally call it the POI. All right. When it comes to record keeping, this is kind of the, one of the key things that sort of uh, set up this discussion as well. Somebody was asking about, well, how do you do record keeping? Of course, we know that record keeping um, for flight training is important. 141 is obviously even more regulated than 61. They both have the regulations. It's just more detailed. Uh, in the 141, I kind of summarized it way down from 141, 101 to, you know, we have to keep track of when somebody enrolled, graduated, finished training or terminated training or transferred and then you have to have this detailed log um, subject flight ops you know all the names and grades obviously really detailed records uh, to do that and that's required to maintain your 141 certificate and this little guy here doesn't really belong i'll go ahead and delete that um, and then with part 61 it's a lot less rigorous in that um, it, all you have to do is the instructor just needs to sign the logbook when they've given flight or ground training. That's basically it. And then they, they have to keep their own record of solo flight endorsements um, and then any kind of uh, knowledge tests for practical test endorsements and the results of those. So that said, there is some value that I definitely want to encourage here um, in that record keeping to potentially think about, even if you're running a 61 program, which we know a good a number of our folks here are, to look at potentially using something more like a 141 style. And there are some reasons for that. And that's what I wanted to just share here is that when you have detailed record keeping, you can see, start catching training issues that may be happening. So for example, if you notice, and if you have a way to view this, of course, the paper is a little more challenging. It's a little easier if you have this in some kind of online format, but you can catch student plateaus. Why is this student doing the same lesson over and over? Or why are they kind of seem to be stuck in this phase? Like they, they haven't sold yet. Now they're at 20 hours or whatever. You can start to catch this so you can go address it because nothing's going to be more frustrating for a student to be doing the same thing over and over again and not making progress. And so maybe that's something we're having them fly with a different instructor often can help. It's, sometimes, it's amazing. I've had it happen and we used to do that on purpose at my school. If we had trouble with somebody, we'd say, hey, we, we would just talk among the instructors and say, would somebody be willing to go fly with this person? And sometimes they would literally go up, do one flight with them and say the same thing I've been telling them in a slightly different way and boom there it was you know they now they've got it um you might be able to catch cfi training issues and what i mean by that is maybe there's something where you have a cfi that's weak in a particular area maybe they just don't quite have a, a great way of teaching ground reference or whatever it might be and so you can catch that if you see a lot of their students having the trouble with the same maneuver or stage you could start to say okay what can we do to help you um, become more effective at teaching that and you can address that and that way of course helping your customers too because you want to avoid that frustration and finally the record keeping if you have detailed record keeping and you have a cfi that gets hired on and moves on it makes it much easier to be able to see this is exactly where they were in the program we don't need to go do another eval flight i had i had i think three four I had at least four instructors during my private because we had, I had people moving on, all this kind of stuff. And it was, and it was a 141 program and it was still frustrating because I still had to go and fly with them a lot of times. And they would be like, well, show me this. And they wanted to see where I was. So having a really good detailed record can show the CFI, this is exactly what's already been done. Um, and so that helps your, helps you with customer retention as well. And don't waste their time and money. Um, so detailed record keeping obviously can be a chore but it can save you when the unfortunate happens. Um, unfortunately, Jim Pittman and I, we worked at, like I said, the school out in Arizona. And one of the things that happened was that uh, was while I was an instructor, we had a, um, a multi-engine uh, accident. We had, unfortunately, a fatality. And 
the one thing that Jim shared with me, obviously it's like, you know, we work really hard to figure out what had happened and we did, and we were able to identify. And one of the reasons he said for that was because of the record keeping, we were able to go back and see what was being done. Why was it being done? We ended up changing our SOP as a result of it. Um, and, and figuring out what was going on. And, and part of what ended up being was that we had a, uh, sort of an errant DPE that was asking people to do, he would cut engines on multis in stalls and power on stalls. He would pull engines on people because he wanted to see what they would do. Um, and, and so then what happened was people started doing that was on the check ride. And then we end up having, um, you know, CFIs out there doing that. And if you know anything about VM, you know, VMC and that kind of stuff, obviously that's a good way to get a, a, a twin into a flat spin or something. So I'm able to identify that. But Jim also told me that when obviously the NTSB came in, we had all kinds of investigations, the FAA was coming in, having those records made it much easier for him to show like, this is what we were doing. Everything was detailed. Um, and we were able to address all these different concerns. And he said it was very much something that, you know, obviously helped us to try to avoid that happening again. And it, luckily it never did, but also to, to deal with the aftermath of all of that too. So having those detailed records can really help you when the unfortunate happens, like I mentioned here. So one of the things we wanted hey, to do Chris, is, yeah. Real quick, we've got a comment from uh, from Michael who says that as a sponsor of student training, the chronological record is very, very helpful. Um, and I can definitely see that. I would also just point out real quick, you can't um, overstate the importance of being able to see some of these training issues that are happening. We have heard unbelievable nightmare stories and I'm sure some of you guys have heard them too, of students who did the same lesson 20 and 30 times uh, in a row, or of students who got stuck on a training plateau and maybe did uh, stayed in that same spot with, with really no progress for 40 hours, you know, enough to earn an entire certificate. So obviously those are pretty extreme examples, but if you can catch some of those things early on, makes a huge difference for your students and particularly for adult students because they don't tolerate that mindless repetition very well at all. Absolutely. And in fact, one of the things we wanted to do is that one of the key parts of getting that information so we can have those advantages is how do we keep track of it? Obviously, you need to have disciplined paperwork no matter what. Uh, Jim used to had a saying, he said, the flight's not over until the paperwork is done. He said, you always like told us that constantly over and over again every month at our CFI meeting. And so that's something you want to do is really um, impress upon your instructors that they need to do this paperwork and it's, sometimes it's like herding cats i know that i've seen it i've experienced it i've lived it um and i was good about it and sometimes i would i would i would miss it so um and then the other thing is having like an online record keeping is something to, to consider as well because having some sort of electronic way can help it um and there we go so i see lonnie saying plateaus were really visible when we use that old school approach um uh to jeppesen uh, the paper flight record so you could just if you had the time to go and review. So I guess that depends on the size of your school. If you've got somebody doing it. So one of the things we wanted to do here was to get an idea of, uh, let me just go ahead and jump to this one. How, how do you think we can, like, I want to see your suggestions here. How do you get your CFIs to complete the paperwork? Because I really would like to um, hear, and I see Pamela saying the course tra tracking application. And in fact, that's one of the things I'm going to mention we get in here in a little bit. So exactly having these online programs really helps with that. Any kind of, away that but how about we we often know that one of the biggest headaches for folks is this idea of getting the cfis to actually do the paperwork so i want to see if you either put in the chat or maybe raise your hand and let us know what are some of the things that you've done that you found that help get the cfis to actually do this to do the record keeping since we can clearly see all these benefits and uh, i'll start it off i see we got required uh paper to, required to complete paperwork or cta during the post-flight briefing good so it is required and in fact maybe in some case because it's during that post-flight briefing uh maybe um let me just put that in here during post-flight and then i'm kind of wondering it's like i would assume that since they're doing that ground at the end you know they're getting paid for it too so paid time for record keeping is one suggestion i might make Establish the expectation. I see that when hiring is a great one too there from Phil. Yeah, that, that's one of the challenges there too, Phil. I see the, the part about um, as a contractor, I'm not allowed to require anything, unfortunately. Um, and so that's where you have to maybe it's like a thing. Yeah, that's a challenge. So you have to figure out how do you go about that um, and to make that happen. So establish the expectation. 
expected to be student-centered grading. It's a team task. I like that. In fact, that's a really, I didn't include that in here, but I, I have a reflection thing that I often use with students where it has, has them, like they lay out all the things they did in the lesson, they grade themselves, and then we talk about a plan for each one. How do we improve upon it? So even if I thought I did like a 10 out of 10, like I just nailed it, how do we maintain that? So that becomes part of the plan. So that's a great way to do that. Student-centered grading is an amazing tool for a post-flight. It's such an important thing. Maybe um, I'm thinking of just part of this too is scheduling that time automatically because oftentimes the reason that paperwork doesn't get done is folks are rushing in after a lesson. Oh, I got to hurry up and get to my next lesson. If you build in that time and that expectation, like you have to finish a half an hour before your next lesson to have that time for post-flight because um, it is such an important part that, to learn and reflect on it. So great. Thanks for putting that, there, including those things in. Thanks, Brad, for that one. So just some ideas, and it's something we can also share anything you might think about um, to help do that, because I know that is probably one of the biggest things that we hear is just getting the CFIs to actually comply with these sorts of things. All right, let's take a look here. Um, let's just run, we're gonna pick one of these polls. We're gonna do this one. So Stephen, we do this one. Which of the following most appeals to you when choosing a syllabus? What kind of features do you look for in the one maybe that you've selected or maybe you're looking at getting a new one or just looking at selecting one? What here would you find uh, would be something useful for you? So we're gonna roll the poll. What do you think, Elizabeth? Uh, anything there particularly appeal to you as uh, someone who would wanna be going through training? Well, I love the idea of um, a mobile app because most of us are on the move and it's great to be able to access materials from wherever you are when you have time. I think very few of us have um, really clear delineations about what time we're spending doing what tasks. So if you happen to be uh, someplace like waiting at a doctor's office or uh, you know, in between meetings, you can take a look uh, no matter where you are. So for me, that would be fantastic. That's a great idea there too, I think, in talking about terms of that ability to be able to, maybe I want to study something that I'm working on wherever I might be, and so I could pull it up on my phone, although it's not as hard on a phone, but certainly a tablet of some sort uh, to be able to study on the go. Really helpful. I, I One of the things I used to beg, even in the 141 program I did as a private, I had uh, my first instructor, we were going through stalls, and I can remember, number one, being afraid of them, like everybody pretty much, but I also remember like trying to do them and having to ask him, like, what's the next step? Like, I couldn't remember, and I remember asking him after like the second time maybe that we did them, and getting frustrated because I was I was spending all my time in the cockpit asking him what to do next versus knowing how to do it. I said, can you write the steps down for me? I was asking for an SOP. Can you write the steps down for me? He wouldn't do it. Um, and then later, I, one of the instructors I had after that very briefly was this, this kid from Embry-Riddle that had just come on. And he gave me his whole Embry-Riddle thing. Like he copied the um, the maneuvers for me. And that was amazing because I could look, literally just go in like, oh, this is how you do it. And it's step by step. Um, and so it's a similar idea. Having that on a mobile app would have been amazing so I could prepare ahead of time. So look at the results. We've got um, record keeping being high up there, online portal, and then by far that mobile app is really interesting to people. And then we've got uh, one person saying the online ground school. So that's really interesting. So this the record keeping part and having that ability, the electronic ability to do that is really key because it makes it easier to access all of that. You know, unless you're unless you're relatively small maybe and you can actually go have time to look i can remember jim this is prior to uh um this is back in the early 2000s and we didn't really have a lot of the online stuff quite yet and i can remember seeing jim pull folders out of the record room because we had some 80 instructors pulling these folders and then we had a cover sheet we had to fill out for him with all this data and so he would then look at that and then he would take it and submit it into he had a spreadsheet he was following so he was making it happen but obviously now by having the instructor put it in there for you it makes it way better and way easier so that said let's take a look i wanted to share just some of the offerings uh when i found i tried to pick out and i apologize to anyone if i might have missed uh, a particular one but what i wanted to look at was that idea of record keeping and and i will throw a shout out there to Rod Machado is one of my favorite guys, um, but he didn't have any record keeping. That's the only reason I didn't include him on here as one example. So I didn't mean to exclude anybody if I did, but I was really looking for ways of doing 141 style record keeping, even if you're running a 61 program. And so what I did here, as you can see, we've got um, AOPA, it's Flight Training Advantage coming out. It's a 61 only right now. We'll talk about that in a second. Then we've got ASA and all the rest all the way down, uh, 61 and 141. And then we've got Talon Systems, which doesn't provide the syllabus within it, but it's a, a management software or management program to keep track of those records. So that's what all those mean. Um, 
when it, uh, I'm trying to remember why I put the asterisk here for these, for Kings, but I don't remember and I'll try to remember, but for adding a syllabus, this column basically means that if you uh, don't necessarily want to use the syllabus from them, um, then you can use, uh, you can add in or customize um, a syllabus of your own. You could literally come up with your own and put it into that program. And of course that's Flight Schedule Pro with their student tracking part. Uh, the Papers 141 and Talon are the three that can do that. And I remember now why King Schools has this. Um, King Schools, you probably often think of as Cessna only, and they just wanted to make sure that I let everybody know that they actually do allow customization so you can do something other than Cessna with it. They do Cessna and other, and that's why the asterisk was there. So it's not just Cessna. Record keeping, notice that all of them have the record keeping ability. Um, the ones with the asterisks there let you know, just as an overview, that uh, it is the paper record keeping. But if you want that online record keeping aspect of it, um, you can then put that into Flight Schedule Pro. They've got that preloaded in. So if that's something you're interested in, um, Flight Schedule Pro is a way that you can use these other syllabi that are already there preloaded into it. Here are all the ones that have an online portal. And again, the ones with the asterisks are just referencing the fact that the online portal um, would be referencing back to using um, Flight Schedule Pro uh, typically. And this is for the flight training because almost all of these folks have, I think, I, think, I think every one of them that's a provider of a syllabus has an online ground school component. It's just the flight portion that um, often it may uh, default into Flight Schedule Pro instead or something else. Maybe you want to put it into a paperless 141 or a talent system because you can do that with those as well. Hey Chris, the, yes. Uh, Phil is pointing out that flight circle is another record keeping option. I didn't know that. Thanks, Phil. So flight circle, add that to the list as well. For one, that if you're looking at an option here, so flight circle is one. I didn't realize they had that, so I missed that one. So again, I apologize, and I, and I certainly didn't do that on purpose. Um, and then we've got the mobile app as well. And so we can see the mobile app options here. Those are the ones that have a flight training portion of a mobile app of some sort, whether it's potentially record keeping or just some sort of access within that. I really, one of the th key things that I saw here, and I know that that's why I was happy that um, that Paul joined on the call from Glime as well, but a lot of these folks offer 141 certification support. So if you're looking at potentially going to a 141 certification type of thing, um, that you can get support. And I know that um, Talent systems, I believe we've got, um, if I'm not mistaken, Brad, I think is on the on the, the line as well. And then uh, they're here, so they might want to put something in the chat, letting them know. And then like I said, Paul Duty from Glimmer are here, but they will they will help you out in one way or another, whether it's through uh, like a TCO type of um, program to help you fill out the paperwork or just give you some advice and help you through that process. So I really think that's important because we hear from so many schools just how hard it is. And yes, Pam, exactly. You don't have to use the Cessna aircraft to use that Cessna system. It's a, it's, it's a basic training system, and, and King Schools wanted to make sure that I, I passed that on. And then finally, the online ground schools are all checked off. And then the extras over here. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out was that with AOPAs, um, our program, we do have an adaptive program that I'll, I'll share a little bit about here in a second. And we have a teaching tips included. With ASA, they wanted to make sure I pointed out that they got their prepware program. They've got a TCO wizard to help you fill out the paperwork. Flight Schedule Pro does all kinds of extra stuff, aircraft management, maintenance, everything else. Uh, Glim has uh, two things. They've got an online ground school progress thing that you can follow that shows where students are in that um, and they're a portal. And then they've got a distance learning. They're approved for distance learning. So it's already has a what's called a letter of acceptance from the FAA, which makes it easy to add it on to yours if that's something you're interested in. Uh, King Schools has their course tracking app, which somebody mentioned that CTA thing. They also have the TCO tools to help you fill out that paperwork. Um, and so does Glime, by the way. Uh, Jeppesen just wanted to let us know that they've been really focusing on core updating things like the, they just already have updated the private. They're working on the instrument and they have a thing called Boeing Learning Solutions that's coming in the future uh, that has a lot of this online record keeping and format. And then um, the Sporties wanted us to mention that they have a maneuver guide in their app. So they have an iPad app. And within that, not only is the curriculum there, but they have step by steps on how to do the different maneuvers, like I was talking about, almost like an SOP that you could use. So just some things to consider and take a look at. So I just want to definitely encourage you to, um, to check all these out. All right. Do I have any more questions in the chat? I don't. All right. And then what I wanted to do was just sort of wrap up talking about just how to acquire a syllabus. And we wanted to show you a little bit too, um, just give you a quick preview. In May, we're planning on doing a, a demo for everybody that's interested 
on uh, this new uh, AOPA Flight Training Advantage. Um, and in that, we do have record keeping built in. It's 61 only right now. We are looking towards the 141 program in the future um, and, and we're getting started on that or working on it. But for this part, for the, uh, the thing, it does a whole bunch of stuff. I didn't want to spend all the time. I just literally wanted to show you two quick parts of it. There is record keeping within it as well, if you if you ever want to check that out. Um, and it shows, like it'll show the detailed lesson of what you did that day, the times, the route of flight, all that kind of stuff. And it has all the scores and notes from the instructor. And then another portion of it here is that there is an overall, that big picture we talked about is part of this too, that there's a syllabus, there's a path to completion. You can see these are the things I need to accomplish. This is what I have not done yet. Uh, so students can go back and look at that. And so can the instructor to figure out where it is. And then there's a, a portal for the owner and instructor to be able to see as well so they can see what's going on and, and look for those patterns just like we talked about. So just another tool that you might consider. So the last bit here is, how do we go about acquiring? Like, how do you get a syllabus? Let's say that, you know, if you aren't using one or if you're thinking about changing, a lot of them are free to download. I know almost every one of the providers will let you go to their website and get it for free uh, in a PDF style format. Um, I would highly recommend that you follow a 141 style of record keeping. Even if you're running your 61 programs, which we know a lot of you are, if you aren't already doing that, it is, has so many benefits that we've already mentioned. Um, just think about that. And then uh, I have here, of course, it's a shameless plug, obviously, but for the uh, AOPA Flight Training Advantage, we call it AFTA, um, that we are actually beta testing that right now. So if you're interested in something like that, that that, that has it as well. Um, for part 141, um, things to look at or check out, and I found this website, and I know that maybe we can put that into the chat. Let me see if I'll, uh, I'll put that in a second when I get a moment, um, that link, but it's uh, FAA's, uh, AC141B, it's actually 141-1, I believe, B. And then there's this website that I found that has all laid out for going for 141 approval, if you're interested. Um, there is uh, plenty of approval-ready syllabi. And what I mean by that is a lot, all these, these providers I already mentioned have syllabi that have already been approved by the FAA before, so it makes it easier when you want to go for that yourself. And then get help. Talk to other schools like this group here or talk to the providers, like I mentioned too. A lot of them have that support in helping that happen. So that said, what I wanted to do in a little bit of time, we've got about uh, just uh, about eight minutes left before our hour is up. I wanted to open it up to you. Please tell us if you have questions, if you have uh, anything you'd like to see from either us, from your fellow schools or any questions at all, please raise your hand, ask a question or put it in the chat. We would love to talk about that. Um, uh, I know that uh, we've got, like I said, we've got uh, both uh, Brad and then Paul, Brad from Talent Systems and Paul Duty on the line as well. They're they're willing to answer questions, I'm sure, uh, when it comes to that TCO support or that kind of thing. So they're they're willing to help you do that if you decide to go that 141 route. So I'm just kind of curious, what is it that you'd like to see from us? Oh, and we got Pam from King Schools. Thanks, Pam. I appreciate that. I'm glad you're on. So yes. So let us know if you do have any questions at all or anything else. Um, Great time for you to get uh, some information directly from the sources here with so many of these providers on the call. So, yes, we've got hesitate. we've got the experts <laughs> right here with us. And by the way, just while we're let's see if any questions pop up, we do have uh, our upcoming topics next month. We're talking about flight school financing solutions. We're going to have uh, two guests on one from AOPA and one from uh, a bank out in Colorado. The name just escapes you right now. And then in May, we've got, uh, we're going to do that demo of our AOPA flight training advantage. And then June, we're going to talk a little bit about the um, the flight training experience survey, how that can help you and how you can get involved. So that's just coming up in the, in the future, letting you know what's coming on. So Paul's got a question. If you're not actually looking at chat right now, Paul from Glime is asking, who here is training under part 61 only? If anybody wants to respond to that, we did see in our survey that we do have uh, more people in this call training 61 only than in any other category. There we go. Lonnie's saying he's part 61, but acts like a 141. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a good way to go. Yeah, if you want to throw it in the chat, we've got Jen's working on it. And then Phil, part 61 as well. I know that Jamie raised her hand there from up in Alaska. And then we got Jim from out in Oakland, part 61, so quite a few. 
And I'm kind of curious, and if you're interested in doing that, don't forget you've got these providers right on the line. If you have questions uh, about that, or if you want to get their contact information, all these folks can help you with that process. If you decide you want to maybe pursue some 141. There's Phil's got his hand up, so go ahead, Phil. Yeah, one of the things I was wondering um, is I seem to have a problem with DPE consistency. Um, we have DPEs that service this area, some at local airports, I and mean, people are having to go around due to scheduling constraints, having to go around at different DPEs. Um, and the problem is that the, the DPEs are, again, very inconsistent on their standards. Like right. I had one that failed a uh, student for not deploying full 40 degrees of flaps on a Cessna 150. He was doing a check ride in, despite the fact it's discouraged. And then I had another DPE that scolded a person for doing the same thing. Right. And then, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, there's a lot of little nuances. Either you follow the POH, like retraction of flaps on a short field landing, right? So the POH says, re retract your flaps on a short field landing. Yet the DPE, I had a DPE threatened to fail one of my students because he did so because they aren't supposed to clean up until after they get off the runway. Yet he was the one that 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 did fail a student because he did not use the 40 degrees of flaps as the POH says it's supposed to do. So it's I don't I'm, how do other people handle all these inconsistencies in these DPEs? So two great comments already in there. And if anybody else wants to jump in, but I see that um, we've got Patrick saying that uh, Oh, I just lost it there. I'm trying to scroll back up, but he basically said that they do a recommended list of DPEs. That's what we did at my old flight school too. We knew the DPEs, like that one I mentioned, we ended up saying we're not using that guy anymore because it was ridiculous. Um, and so locally owned and operated. So they may be making a list of the ones that you know that that are willing to work with you in the sense of when, because that's, that's we're talking nuance there, right? We're not talking, it's not even the ACS. It doesn't lay all those details out. Exactly. And so it's nuanced. And that's, that's you know, I agree that, that that kind of stuff should not be failing items. Um, Remember that the DPAs can be challenged or audited. And be, again, they're supposed to follow the ACS, follow the airplane flying handbook. So Lonnie mentions that. Um, and so don't be afraid to push back on them and, and potentially, you know, I guess if you had to, if it was really an issue, um, you know, I, I hate to always do that, try to work it out but other than that, but go to the FISDO if you need to. Um, and then with Jen, she's mentioning aerodynamic is all she's saying part 61 only, but they run it. She's just talking about theirs. And she said, our DPEs are booked months out. How do we encourage the FAA to train more? That is something, Elizabeth, you might know a, a bigger picture on that. I know that AOPA is working on that. We've been encouraging uh, and getting more DPEs. Do you know any other details that I'm missing? Because I, I know in general that we are working on that in our government affairs division. Yeah, we are. And we're, we're putting together a panel of experts to develop um, a very thoughtful list of recommendations for the FAA on some of the things that need to happen. Because the issue you're talking about there, Jen, is huge. And we hear it all over the country. Um, so. Uh, we want to make sure that we go to the FAA with a really comprehensive understanding of what the problems are in different parts of the country uh, and that we've had the advice of, of experts on that. So um, you'll be hearing a lot more about that from us in the coming months. Uh, and we're very hopeful that we can uh, make some good progress because lots of people are struggling with the same thing. And as you guys know, the FAA uh, did make some changes to allow uh, examiners to work in a broader area or outside of their area. Um, but something that we've heard as, as a fallout of that is an examiner might leave their normal area, go to a place where there's a known shortage, uh, stay there for a month, and now there's nobody in the area where they're from to give check rides for a whole month. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's kind of a double-edged sword, that particular uh, change. So we're going to see if we can't get something a little more comprehensive and more effective going. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I saw some other comments in there. I know that uh, Pam shared her contact information um, if you want to from King Schools. And I want to apologize. I kept saying Brad. I meant Austin from uh, Talon is on there as well. So if any of you folks want to put in your uh, contact information, Paul Duty as well, um, feel free to do that in the chat. You can see that information. I know Elizabeth put a link to that article. Um, it says, remember, as you're as a 141, you may have self-certification privileges. That's right. There's, there's Paul put his stuff in there. So that's exactly right. I know some of the schools will do that. Some of the universities will have the ability to um, have their own check airmen and, and run that. So you can do that as a school. So I know I've heard of some schools that have their own uh, examiner. So that might be something to look into as well if you're if you've got enough going on. So check into that process. 
So yeah, Paul put the stuff in there from Glime. Um, I know that we've come to the end of our hour here. I will take a moment if there's any other questions. I know you guys are busy and I don't want to necessarily hold you up, but very much there's Austin just put his information in from Talon. And again, Austin, I apologize. Hey, Jamie, thanks for being here. Um, um, I, then, I, have a, I just have one comment. Um, uh, Chris and Elizabeth, I wanted to, I know this might not be the appropriate place to say this, but um, I want to offer my deepest condolences about Mike Collins. Um, he was just a great guy. Thank you so yeah. much, Jamie. It's it's really appreciated. And uh, for those of you who are not aware, Mike Collins, who was with AOPA for almost 30 years and, and played major roles uh, in the magazines, especially Pilot Magazine and in management uh, here at AOPA, he passed away on February 25th from COVID-19. And uh, as you can imagine, it is hitting our work family very, very hard. And we have been grateful for all the warm wishes uh, coming to us from throughout the community. Uh, Mike was a, a tremendous presence, a force to be reckoned with, and an all around great guy. So we are very, very sorry to be saying goodbye to him. And thank you, Jamie. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thank, yeah. thank you very much, Jamie. Like I said, he's probably one of the, I said he's one of the nicest people I think I ever met um, and just a super guy. So yeah, we very much yeah. miss him. So. He was a great guy. He was really cool. Yeah, no doubt. So we appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to throw out there was that uh, uh, pilotfinance.com, I see Lonnie. No, they're not part of that conversation. Just we had somebody reach out to us and then we brought our own finance folks in. But that's a good point. So I'll try to remember that, that we can maybe include that in the resources. So thank you for that, Lonnie. And then Paul mentioned that he's got from Glime down there, he's got a white paper uh, to how to achieve 141 certification and he provides his email there so if you're interested in that check that out um, again there on the chat section which you should have access to if for any reason you lose any of this and can't get it please email us at ftinitiative at aopa.org or you can even just email me directly to mine's just chris chris dot moser m-o-s-e-r at aopa.org um, i can throw it in here let's see and we will be glad to get you uh, any information. I'll give you the other one as well. Whoops. And of course, this is being recorded and um, you will be able to view it at a later date as soon as we get it posted. So if you have uh, anything that you wanted to take out of here, you can do that as well. Yes, and please ignore the FT on the end of my email. That was not supposed to be there. That was a typo. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, so, right. Chris, it seems that we are out of time, but uh, this was a really good conversation. Thanks everybody for, for putting in your thoughts and questions. It's, uh, it's definitely interesting when we get to hear from all of you and hear your perspectives. Chris? And, and yes, and please let us know if there's anything you'd like us to research and find out or get guests on, please let us know. Shoot us at FT Initiative or my email address is fine as well. Um, and let us know, we, we definitely want to be serving you. So you tell us what you're interested in and we will, we will follow up and, and do whatever we can to help you. Yeah, that's how we came to this topic today. And uh, we are always looking for ideas that are going to serve you the best. So uh, don't hesitate. If you've got an idea for a conversation or a question you want to ask, let us know. Yeah, we'll do. All right. Well, thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate all being here. Thanks, everyone.